We'll now do a complete example with estimation using graphical models, just like we did in the potential outcomes lecture in week two. In fact, we'll use the exact same example. So let's recall that example. It was about the effect of sodium intake on blood pressure. This is an important causal inference problem because 46% of Americans have high blood pressure, and high blood pressure is associated with increased risk of mortality. We take this epidemiological example from Luque Fernandez et al., 2018. The outcome is systolic blood pressure, which is a continuous variable. The treatment is sodium intake, which is also continuous, but we will binarize this to 1 if it's above 3.5 milligrams and 0 if it's below. This binarization turns out to not be important for this example because we would get the exact same answer if we kept it as continuous. It's just a bit simpler to show if we binarize it. And then in addition to the outcome and treatment, we have two covariates, W, age, and Z, which is the amount of protein excreted in urine. And this data is a simulation. So because it's a simulation, we actually do know the true ADE which is 1.05. The range of values used in this simulation from Luque Fernandez et al. is biologically realistic. Now that we've introduced the problem, the first thing to do, now that we're using causal graphs, is write down the causal graph. We have that age is a common cause of sodium intake and blood pressure, and that the amount of protein excreted in urine is actually a common effect of sodium intake and blood pressure. The fact that Z is a collider here is really important. So now that we've written down the causal graph, we'll try to identify the causal estimand, which will take the expected value of Y given due T. This is the statistical estimand that we saw last week in the potential outcomes lecture. Importantly, we're conditioning on both W and Z. And as you can see, we shouldn't be conditioning on Z because it induces collider bias. So to actually identify this causal effect, we need to not condition on Z, which gives us this statistical estimate, which we get from the causal graph. So we can get this from the backdoor adjustment that we saw, and because that's not framed in terms of expectations, we can just take the expected value over Y of that. Now that we've finished identification, in other words, we've taken a causal estimate and transformed it into a statistical estimate using the causal assumptions that we've written down in the form of a causal graph, now that we've done that, we can proceed with estimation. So remember that the true average treatment effect is 1.05, and here is the adjustment formula, which is very similar to the backdoor adjustment. Here we're adjusting for x. Then, as we saw last week, we estimate this by taking an empirical sum over the n data points. So the i in the summation here indexes each data point, and then x sub i is the covariance of the ith data point. And so we're taking that outer expectation over x in the identification line, and we're estimating it with this empirical sum over the n data points. And then we estimate these inner expectations by modeling them with some, some model, some machine learning, some statistical model. Because this is simulated data, and we know that y is generated as a linear function of t and x, a linear model will work just fine here because the data is linear. But in general, you could imagine plugging in some arbitrary statistical model here. We'll now show the different estimates that you get when you use different adjustment sets. So look at the identification line up there where we're adjusting for x. x is our adjustment set here. When x is the empty set, in other words, when we don't adjust for anything, we get an estimate of 5.33 for the average treatment effect. So this is a huge overestimate of the true average treatment effect, which is 1.05. We're overestimating it by 407%. Now, if we were to just adjust for all covariates available, which is what we did last week in the potential outcomes lecture, we get the average treatment effect of 0.85. This corresponds to a 19% error. The reason that we see this 19% error is because of the collider bias we get 
from adjusting for the collider Z. If we just take Z out of the conditioning set, then we get an unbiased estimate. And here we get an estimate of 1.0502. So now we've taken the error all the way down to 0.02%. And this remaining error is purely due to sampling randomness. So to recap this example, if we do the naive thing and don't adjust for anything, we end up with 407% error. If we adjust for all covariates, so that's W and Z, then we end up with 19% error because we have collider bias. If we use the causal graph to identify our causal estimate, then we find that we should only adjust for W. And then if we only adjust for W, we end up with 0.02% error. This is because this estimate is actually unbiased, and this error is only due to sampling variability. To be fair to the general culture around potential outcomes, the general rule, as I said before, is to not adjust for post-treatment covariates like Z here. So if we don't adjust for that, that's this graph, then the culture around potential outcomes would also lead to an unbiased estimate, if the researcher makes sure to know that Z is post-treatment. However, this rule to adjust for all covariates except for post-treatment covariates can't prevent M bias. So in this graph, if we condition on Z2, we're going to have collider bias. If we observed Z1 or Z3, we would be able to prevent this collider bias by also conditioning on Z1 or Z3. But in this graph, they're unobserved. So the only way to actually prevent this collider bias, or the specific form, which is M bias here, is to not condition on Z2, right? And the way to know not to condition on Z2, even though it may be pre-treatment here, is to write down the causal graph. All right, so with that, we can conclude week three. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell below if you want to get notifications when I upload next week's lecture. I usually upload them in the mornings and then don't send the email until later in the day. And don't forget to leave your questions and comments in the YouTube comments below. I'll make sure to respond reasonably quickly. And I'll see you in the next lecture.